morning, good afternoon to all my CX friends, leaders, innovators. Welcome to the second day of the CX Transformation Virtual Summit. Uh, yesterday, we had some fantastic, mind-blowing uh, sessions uh, where we had people like Kola, Peter, uh, Mark, uh, Ivy, Seema, Edna, Sachin, Femi, you know, from various industries, cross industries, from cross regions, coming in and sharing their insights. Uh, we also had uh, Mumbi, who was doing a fantastic job in uh, chairing the event and leading us uh, through, through the whole day. So today we are, have another fantastic lineup of speakers and thought leaders and innovators. So I take this opportunity to welcome you today and uh, welcome again to all the CX leaders and innovators. Mumbi, welcome back. Uh, it, it's a great pleasure to have you as the uh, conference chairperson for today's event as well. So welcome to the show. The stage and the screen is all yours. Great, thank you, Mohammed. Um, yeah, um, they say the new buzzword in business is I'm on mute. <laughs> 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 so there I was. Um, thank you very much uh, for the welcome and welcome to all our panelists, uh, speakers and attendees. Um, thank you for the kind words, Mohammed, and I, it is my absolute pleasure to chair the conference. Um, yesterday was quite an interesting day, and I will recap that in a few minutes. So uh, glad to see that um, uh, the attendees are starting to join in, and I'm sure we will get to similar numbers as what we had yesterday, and hopefully more for those who can make it today. Um, so just to recap um, yesterday's session. Um, we started off with uh, Kola taking us through uh, customer intimacy um, and he had quite some specific um, ways to implement customer intimacy for us to actually achieve trust with our customers. And I will bring up this word trust because it came up with every speaker. I am sure they had not spoken to each other about it, uh, but I believe um, the output of intimacy is trust. and. Um, to a large extent, the output of the work we do in customer experience is actually trust. Um, so he went through some ideas around how to implement intimacy from a customer perspective, from an organization perspective, in terms of reorientating our customer service and also how to manage agents. Um, so Kola works with MTN Nigeria, um, and I believe agents are a big part of the business. Uh, so, um, quite some points that we can use in our own businesses as far as that is concerned. Uh, we then had Peter Van Eysen uh, from Genesis, and Peter took us through the sales um, journey management, um, and he focused uh, quite squarely on the website and how you can do that journey management on your website, the ability to pick up where the customer is, where the drop-offs are happening, and uh, link that to your face-to-face -face or telephonic conversations, to your chats. Um, as the customer comes in, uh, the agent can actually see uh, where the customer has been, what they've been doing, and be able to contextualize um, the question that the that the customer is actually asking at that point in time as you link up with them. Again, the word empathy came up here, and uh, if we can link that back to Kola's uh, trust aspect and the importance of intimacy. Uh, uh, then we had Mark from Mark Amat from SAP, and Mark was talking about um, creating an intelligent enterprise in the experience economy, uh, similarly taking us through data and the importance of listening, understanding, and acting, uh, but using experience data combined with operational data. Um, and um, his conversation actually made real um, the use of data. We don't actually have to ask clients all the time or customers to give us um, their views or what their, uh, their information, because some of that stuff we can pick up on the data. But it's about uh, combining the actual experience data as well as the operational data that brings in the magic. Um, so again, the themes of empathy coming through in Mark's presentation. So if I was to look at what came through um, as a core theme in yesterday's conversations, um, uh, and before I do that, actually, let me speak about the panelists as well, uh, which the panel was led by Sashin, and Sashin uh, guided the panelists to actually give us 
specific examples of how they've navigated COVID-19, what it has, the impact it has had on their businesses, and whether businesses are actually changing for the short term or are there long-term strategies. That was quite interesting for me um, because there were different approaches. There were some businesses who were looking at these uh, changes long term. There were businesses. There were businesses that were looking at it from a um, short-term perspective, but there are also businesses that were looking at a hybrid approach where they're saying um, we'll look at it, um, we will combine the two uh, depending on the business and where we are at in the business. Um, so that was quite interesting as well, but with them as well, uh, key issues that came on were uh, the importance of people and empowering both our employees and customers, uh, engaging them in um, every aspect, as well as systems and processes, and the critical aspect of digitization that comes with that to be able to respond in an agile approach, in an agile way. Uh, the key that COVID has provided in accelerating the digital transformation. Um, and for many of us, we sit in organizations where digital has been a buzzword and we've been talking about it for years, and all of a sudden, companies could support remote from work, uh, uh, remote work because um, there was no option. So uh, such a fantastic uh, accelerator, although not the best way we would have liked it to happen. And with all that, the importance of agility. Uh, COVID has been quite a quick, um, has had quite a quick impact on business and in our lives in general and agility is quite important to be able to respond um, covid is a pandemic that we hope will never be repeated uh, but i think um, the lesson has been learned in terms of i think sima called it creating light solutions um, to be able to drive agility all the time. And so to summarize the themes that were coming through yesterday, um, and I think the key theme that came through all presentations was around trust, um, and trust through empathy and intimacy that we create with our customers. Um, I know for a lot of businesses, I work in the financial services and intimacy is not really the cool thing to do uh, because we work with numbers, we work with a lot of accountants. Um, so being able to translate that intimacy and empathy into numbers um, is quite critical. But it is through that empathy that we then get loyalty from our customers and our employees and are able to generate ongoing value um, from our uh, from our businesses, for our businesses. So uh, quite insightful a day. I'm sure we'll have as exciting a day as that uh, for today. We have other speakers um, coming from various angles. Uh, we will be starting off with Yugesh um, uh, in uh, talking to us about the role of the Chief Experience Officer. Um, I believe for many of us that's quite interesting. I must say that um, when I started in the customer experience world, I applied for a role without actually knowing what that role was about. And I had literally to figure out and um, and come up with what I needed to be doing in that particular role. So uh, for many of us who are starting now, uh, that's not the case. Uh, there are many who've gone through the journey and we can actually uh, learn from them rather than starting from scratch. Apologies for that, for me and my papers. Um, I want to now introduce Yugesh, who's gonna be our first speaker. Uh, Yugesh uh, is a good friend of mine and uh, we hardly get to see each other these days. Uh, actually even to speak. Um, I think we should change that. Uh, we've learned to go online. Uh, Yugesh is the owner and founder of the CX Group. Uh, the CX Group is a consulting, advisory and training employee. Uh, she established it in 2017 and before that she had worked in many uh, big organizations like Ford, SA, Standard Bank, Old Mutual, ABSA, Arena Holdings and Edcon, uh, to mention a few. Um, the key to business success, she says, is the solid in-depth understanding of the CX world and the ability to take this understanding and shape it into solutions for the corporate world. She has a 20 year obsession with customer experience and is recognized as one of the top experts in South Africa. She has worked in the different industries, as I mentioned, uh, such as financial services, telecoms, media, entertainment, um, and that spans B2B, B2C worlds as well, and then B2B to C models. So prior to founding CX Group, she, ha she had a role such as Chief Customer Experience Officer, Group Customer Experience Executive, um, and she's tackled uh, personal decisions to reaching important mil milestones. So her job is to guide you on the path to customer success um, as the Chief Experience Officer. Uh, 
She's fueled by her commitment to excellence and goes the extra mile to ensure clients are fully satisfied with, our work, with her work. Um, the group has been involved in projects such as sales strategy development, designing the sales experience, product design, customer experience strategy development, contact center enhancements, CX training, employee and customer journey mapping, and voice of the customer program, um, among others. So uh, welcome, Yugesh. Uh, we look forward to your insights as we start uh, this day two. Um, we see that our attendees are still coming in, um, and I'm sure they will find that there's a lot of value in what you're going to offer and from your great experience that you've had. Um, so welcome. Sorry, you guess you're still on mute, I think. <laughs> I had to do well, we all used, We're all getting used to this new type of technology, and I had a colleague that was on as well that was sending me a picture of what he's seeing so that I could also make sure that I've got the right screens up. So um, I'm, I'm in presenter mode. Is that going to be a problem? Are people going to be able to see my screen as well as my notes? Uh, I yes. just want to verify that. That's what we are seeing right now, Yugesh. Uh, we are seeing your presenter mode. So you probably want to switch to the other mode. Yeah, OK. So let's now you've just made my job a little bit more difficult, but I'm going to I'm going to do the right screen. thing. Yeah, that one. Yeah, it should. Uh, um, at the bottom. The one with some dotted lines, that's it. Thank you. Is that OK? So cool. I'm going to go off so, now and give you the platform. Perfect. Thank you so much. So um, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I can't say good morning and I can't say good afternoon. So I'm going to say good day. And I was going to say good day, Africa, but I'm going to say good day, world, because um, we're now a global village and we've got people put together uh, presenting. And I must say for myself, it's a very new experience because I haven't had to get onto a plane and I haven't had to pack a suitcase and get ready in the morning and go for breakfast and then attend a um, a conference which has been quite a new experience and I must say I can get used to it but I am terribly missing speaking to people and being face to face with each other with everybody and you know just the warmth of being around people so this is my first uh, conference um, online uh, so please forgive me if the birds start chirping or uh, the dogs start bark barking I've locked the kid away and I'm going to um, get going with the topic that's been given to me today so uh, my subject um, uh, sorry let me first just say I know that uh, Mumbi has given you an introduction thank you so much Mumbi so just to reiterate I'm Yugesh Freilink and I am the chief experience officer for the CX group which is a South African based company that's involved in um, customer experience uh, management consulting we do um, a level of advisory as well as training so um, i've been given the topic of uh, the evolving um, role of the customer experience officer but i've also been asked to unpack and look at the what's happening with the CXO role and is the CXO role becoming the new CMO role which is the chief marketing officer so we all know that the world is changing and the world is changing even faster in the last 150 days of uh, the pandemic and the great great way to talk about change is a perfect uh, sorry let me the great way to talk the great thing to talk about change is, is a statement that sorry guys i'm messing around here um i can't see my screen anymore ah okay a great statement made by a great person about change is bill gates where he spoke about i'm trying to get this okay sorry um 
Bill Gates said, this is a fantastic time to join the business world because business will change in the next 10 years more than it has changed in the last 50 years. And added to that conversation and added to that quote, I'd like to say that the world has changed significantly in the last 150 days. We have seen the most amount of change in probably the shortest period ever historically and i think we've shifted business like mumbi was talking about people's book uh, that was sharing yesterday that we have significantly shift gears and there's been a significant amount of change in business and i think we've experienced more change than we ever had in the last 10 years when it comes to technology when it comes to understanding customers and when it comes to changing business so my topic for discussion today is around three key elements. I keep on key elements. It's the evolution of the evolutions that we're currently going through in business, which is the traditional uh, traditional businesses and where they've shifted to. The traditional chief marketing officer and where he's moving to as well as the rise of the chief experience officer like mumbi spoke about earlier saying that when she first started her job she applied for a job not knowing exactly what it was going to be now we've had about 10 years of experience specifically in south africa where we actually know what the role is supposed to do and we know what the role the function and the role and the responsibilities are there is still a bit of a debate in south africa Africa and I suppose the larger Africa as to where the chief experience officer should sit within a corporate organization. I then want to go through discussing with you a little bit about where the, the lines have been blurred. They, 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 there's a blend and a blur between roles in the organization and I would want to unpack that a little bit with you to understand why we have some of these um, disruptions in the business that is actually negative, is negatively impacting our shift and our movement towards being more customer centric. And then I want to share with you who is doing what? What has have people spoken, uh, uh, introduced customer experience officers in their business? Have they introduced the chief marketing officer in their businesses have they removed the chief marketing officer in their businesses and what's going on with trying to grapple with managing customer experiences for uh businesses across the globe so let's unpack and talk a little bit about today's customer today's customer is everybody that's sitting in this in this virtual room at this moment in time. We've gone through significant change. We are hyper digital. We work on average three to five screens at a particular time. We have our LinkedIn open. We have our Facebook pages open. We have WhatsApp open. We have our cellular phones active, waiting for a phone call. And we also have um, you know, the screens that we're working on and getting done and work getting done. And we also in conferences all the time or conference sessions or online meetings with um, our, um, our staff or colleagues. The next thing that we've understood from an employee, uh, from a customer perspective, is that customers more and more have understood that time is a commodity. We want more convenience and we want more effortless engagement with businesses. We want businesses to do more of the thinking. And I want you as a business to understand my needs before I even understand what I need. Think for me and handhold me and make life easier for me. That's been a huge message that's happened over the last 10 years. Customers also know that they have the power. They have more choice. Uh, they have more opportunity to engage with far much more industries and companies than they ever had before. I'm not restricted to where I live anymore. They're more educated and they are far less trusting. And that is a key word that needs to start becoming uh, an integral part of narrative within corporate South Africa, corporate global corporate world worlds. 
trust is something that is being lost. And if you think about yourself right now, and you think about the first time you had to online purchase, you had to purchase online something that you've never had to because of the global pandemic, there was a level of not trusting whether you were going to get your uh, parcels, whether you're going to get all the items that you paid for, and you double and triple checked those parcels when it actually came through to your front door. The other thing we know is that as customers, we trust each other more than we trust the marketing advertisements out there. I would rather pick up the phone or have a conversation with a colleague, a friend, a family member around how they have experienced a product before I go out and purchase the product myself. I will also first click on the reviews online and have a look at what customers have rated you for your services before I actually choose to do uh, to engage with you or when I'm evaluating the multiple experiences that are out the, the multiple products that are out there the reviews often help me choose the business that I am going to do that I am going to buy from and then we want more personalized experiences I don't want to repeat my 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 story again to you I want you to understand who I am, whether I'm on an online uh, platform, whether I am at the onboarding stage of my life cycle with you, or whether I am walking in to a branch or to a store. I want you to know me. I want you to know my history, and I want you to know my likes and dislikes, no matter who I'm speaking to. So this demanding customer has led to and a evolution of technology within our corporate space. That evolution of technology that the customer has, has led to the evolution of the corporate, um, corporates becoming more in tuned with technology that's out there, adopting that new technology. And that new technology is forcing us to relook at the structures within our organizations. That in itself has led to the birth of the new CMO. Now, part of my discussion with you is to talk to you about the customer, um, the, the, the chief marketing officer and how his role has evolved in the business. Advertise, the chief marketing officer was predominantly responsible for advertising, marketing, research, and brand management. He was more involved with working with an agency and having that agency deliver on his campaigns and his marketing um, uh, initiatives within the business. What significantly has changed between the old days CMO and the modern CMO is that the CMO of the older days was more linked to selling. He was meant to bring feet through the door and that's where his job stopped. Once the evolution and the introduction of more technology came through, we needed to start introducing a different, well, we needed to introduce new roles and responsibilities into the chief marketing officer's role. And that required him to start becoming more relationship-based. He needed to start understanding this customer and the various types of customers that were coming through the door. He needed to ensure that what he was selling from a customer value proposition out there and the promise that he was making from a, a value proposition to the customers was in fact actually what was being delivered by the business itself. So that forced marketing to start getting involved into, in the leadership of the business, in the organizational effectiveness of the business, in the change management of the business to align the promise, close the gap between the value proposition and what is actually being experienced by the customer. So businesses chose one or two or three things. Businesses chose to either enhance the chief marketing officer's role or 
start introducing a new role into the business, which was the chief experience officer. And there you start seeing the tug and the tug, the pull and push and the tugging between the two roles or multiple roles within the organization. The CXO role was introduced into the business and was born largely in the customer service space the complaint management space or the customer operations design space or the business analyst space. So we grew up in those worlds and we most of us have a contact center background or a business an analyst background. And having started off in that space, also we were forced to grow because of customer demands increasing, because of customers wanting to push uh, for more trust, for more innovation, for more options, we then started realizing that the CXO in a business, if the business chose to re, uh, realize a CXO uh, in their organization, needed to also work across the entire landscape of the business. Customer experience officers need to be involved in the development of a customer experience strategy. You can't develop a customer experience strategy if you don't understand the customer you need to have an insight you need to have a very very strong understanding of your customer in order to develop a strategy that is going to be aligned to what the customer wants we need to as customer experience officers constantly be involved in the operational management of the business and the delivery of the operational experiences that we are selling out there to the organization. So we involved in customer experience design, which is journey mapping. We do a, we do a huge amount of journey mapping with cross-functional teams to understand exactly what is required from the customer and how we need to change the business and how the business operates and make, change processes and policies in order to match the customer expectations. Customer, the, the chief experience officer also needs to start getting involved in real time management and real time understanding of how customers are experiencing the service, uh, the services and the products of a company across the customer's life cycle. Whether your customer is about to leave you or whether a new customer is about to join you, you need to provide visibility to the entire business on how those customers are experiencing each stage of the life of their life cycle with you you can only get this right through the employees so that forces you to go into selling customer experience into the organization and ensuring that certain business certain stakeholders certain frontline employees or all employees start becoming more accountable for customer experience and the only way you get that done is by ensuring that you are influencing the employee experience as well as the culture within the organization so i'm sure you're starting to see parallels between what the cmo used to do and what the cxo is is doing and if you are in a business that is evolving at this moment and is changing at this moment you often find that the cxo and the cmo are often duplicating efforts or they either work exceptionally well together where they're leveraging off each other and they are helping each other enhance the single focus, the customer experience, or you find that they generally, or you find that there's disagreement between the two roles where this, they, there's, 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 a, there's a, a tug of war going on where who is responsible for what. Now, some companies due to that have taken out the customer experience the customer the chief marketing officer role completely where they've said we don't need the old marketing functionality where it is just um the blasting of communication on what we do as customer uh, as 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 a business anymore we are requiring two-way conversations going forward we're requiring businesses to start we're requiring our ch chief marketing officer to send out messages and bring back customer opinion customer perception and then we need to tweak how we are uh, delivering our business offering based on what customers are saying so 
all in all, they are, the lines are starting to blur with regards to the chief marketing officer and the chief experience officer. There's fundamentally three things that we've seen shifting in this, uh, in this space. We're starting to see that there's the, the co companies are starting to evolve the chief marketing officer role, and they're having the chief experience officer or a success manager, a customer manager report into a chief marketing officer. So they're blending the customer, the chief marketing officer role and the chief experience officer role, and that they are calling the evolution of the customer, uh, the chief marketing officer role. The second thing that they are doing is that they are introducing the chief experience officer role. And you know that with both these roles, what we are requiring or what this role is requiring is getting the entire organization to move in one direction. It's the orchestration of the entire organization to a single point to a well-defined customer experience that everybody hangs their hats onto. So they introdu introducing a customer experience role is one of the solutions. The other solution is removing the chief marketing officer role and introducing multiple roles within the organization. Some companies have introduced a chief growth officer, which is a very sales driven initiative that has a very strong sales KPI, but ensures that the person is involved in the customer experience offer uh, the customer experience. Some companies have introduced a chief brand officer, and some of them have even introduced the president of brand roles. So companies at this moment understand without a doubt that customer experience is exceptionally important to businesses. What they are still trying to figure out is where the customer experience roles and responsibilities should sit. Should it sit within a CMO role? Should it sit within a CXO role? Or should it sit across the three, across multiple roles, meaning deconstructing the chief marketing officer role and introducing multiple roles within the organization? So, where did I get all this information from around the CMO and the CXO? So we've seen some leading brands doing some really um, innovative and disruptive um, implementation plans. So some examples that I have for you is Johnson & Johnson, what they've done in 2019, early last year, they removed their chief marketing officer role and they spread the chief, they, they introduced a chief experience officer role. The Hyatt Hotel eliminated the chief marketing officer role as well in 2018. So they've been operating since 20, 2018 without a marketing officer. McDonald's split the role of the chief marketing officer into a traditional chief marketing of, uh, officer and a customer manager. Uber has no chief marketing officer. They did have a chief marketing officer for about six months when they, when they launched, and they currently only have a VP that handles marketing, customer experience, and comms and public policies. Coca-Cola is an interesting leader in this space. So as far as records go, Coca-Cola has was the first company that removed the chief marketing officer role and introduced a chief growth officer. That chief growth officer was introduced and was asked to manage the customer experience in the organization. Two years later, which is 2020, they have reintroduced, they've taken away the chief growth officer, they've reintroduced the chief marketing officer, and they have split the original role of the chief growth officer across three different chiefs in the organization. And they have kept 
the chief, the traditional chief marketing officer role, but they have also added to his job description a strong sales operational role as well. So as you can see, businesses are starting to juggle, they're starting to toggle the chief marketing officer and the chief experience officer, all with the one understanding and the one need of wanting to get closer to understanding this customer, wanting to ensure that they understand customers and they also reach the numbers the the numbers that they need from a shareholder value promise perspective so who's the boss and what are we seeing from a um a numbers perspective across organizations tech target released this graph in 2019 and they showed a shift in businesses across the ceo holding the responsibility of chief customer experience or, or chief customer experience officer coos introducing holding the role of chief customer cmos holding the role of chief customer or having not or not having a chief uh, customer experience officer in their businesses and you can see that the graph on my uh, left hand side shows you that in 2017, 39% of companies interviewed sh did not have a chief customer experience role. And only 30% of businesses had the chief experience officer role report directly into the CEO. Later on in 2019, only 11% of, cust of businesses don't have a chief customer experience role and 46 percent of chief customer experience officers report into the ceo we do have instances where the chief the experience officer is reporting into the cmo 21 percent of businesses have the cxo reporting into the marketing uh, department within organizations. We are seeing that shift as well across the chief customer officer. So we've got chief marketing officers, chief customer officers, and we're seeing significant, uh, see, seeing significant shifts with the introduction of CXO and the introduction of a chief customer officer as well within organizations. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope that I have shared the various things that are happening within the business landscape effectively with you? And what is the right answer? I think there's no wrong answer. I think the answer is that as long as we ensure that we are keeping customer centricity at the center of whatever we are doing, we can try and test the various methods that we've spoken about, evolving the chief marketing officer role, introducing a chief experience officer role but the jobs to be done does not get removed the job still needs to be done how and who is going to do it we're starting to see trends we are starting to see companies plug and play but what we need to constantly understand is that we need to plug and play we need to have businesses internally built for that kind of change and plug and play scenarios and we need to have a strong change management uh, program within the organization and a strong culture that allows for the changes to happen within organizations until we find the perfect fit. I don't think a cookie cutter solution is going to work here. I think each organization is going to have to find their own look and feel and, and what's going to work for their customers. So. I'd like to end with a chief marketing officers, the chief marketing officer um, from Adobe, uh, Anne Lewins, and her she she defines customer experience management effectively. And I think what we need to know is that there's still a requirement for customer experience management who and how it works within your organization is going to be up to the organization itself so chief customer experience management is the orchestration and personalization of the entire end-to-end -end 
customer experience moment to moment at scale on any channel in real time. It's about harnessing the power of artificial intelligence, immersive data, and new screens to deliver connected, engaging, and hyper-personalized experiences at scale. So I hope I've shared with you um, some interesting information and I've given you some thoughts to go away with. And that's me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yugesh, um, for those uh, insightful remarks. Um, yesterday, we rushed through the program, so I do want to uh, slow it down today, um, just so that we can have some interaction. Uh, for our audience, please, um, there is a chat uh, box where you can post your questions, and um, the speakers will be able to respond to that. Uh, Yugesh, before you disappear, I do have a question for you. Or a, um, and that's um, thank you. Um, yeah, so um, thank you for those remarks. Um, you've you've spoken around the evolving role of the CMO of the CXO, and I'm not sure if our attendees were expecting that last point that there's no right or wrong answer. It depends on where it's uh, it works for your organization. Um, and from my experience, that is so true because. Um, uh, I have been in roles in very different spaces, um, not even in the CMO or COO uh, world in totally different spaces. Um, and uh, one of the things I have discovered is that other than just where the role sits, it's also the dynamics of the organization itself and how it gets uh, things done uh, that influences the effectiveness of customer experience as a function. Um, what would be your comment around that, around um, uh, or what your experience has been around the nature of organizations and how that influences how the uh, customer experience function gets done. So, um, Mumbi, I think like you, I've played lots of roles within uh, organizations and I've seen it play out uh, in various um, phases. And you often find that um, you know, the, 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 the way of doing business has changed significantly. And uh, a friend of mine um, spoke to me recently and said to me, the business of business is broken. And we need to get out of the, um, uh, the business of challenging each other internally and seeing each other as competitive. Com competition or, or comp competitors. We need to actually work as a consolidated, well-functioning team that supports each other to get to where we need to go to as an organization. So I often, you know, as a CXO, and I'm sure some of the guys that hold customer roles, you often find you know, the operate, operations teams or the marketing teams sort of looking at you quite weirdly saying, you know, what are you doing here in my meeting? You've got nothing to do with marketing. Or why do you want to be invited to an ops meeting? You've got nothing to do with ops. But in actual fact, we all need to understand that the old KPIs that we used to have forced us to put blinkers on and not look outside at the wider organization. We need to take those blinkers out and we need to understand that our business is everybody's business in the organization. And if the marketing teams can support the business to get smarter in the customer experience space. If you want one person leading customer experience in the business, or you want to share that role with the chief marketing officer, I think it's important for us to thrash it out and understand what is going to be the final benefit for customers. Um, we often, we know that marketing has long been guilty of putting out a, uh, a, a customer value proposition, selling a beautiful idea and concept about what doing business with our companies are. And when the com customer actually experiences that, um, uh, when the company actually experiences that um, uh, service, it's a huge disconnect between what we saw in an advert or uh, on a television or in a campaign. And the CMO needs to now 
work with the people in the organization and take advice from the organization on how to close the gap between that promise that North Star that we're selling and whether the business can actually deliver to that North Star. Thank you. Thanks for that, Yugesh. Um, yeah, just going back again to the issue of um, the customer experience function being about uh, collaboration and bringing the different areas of the business together uh, to synchronize what we deliver to customers. Uh, perspective across the board so um, thank you for your comments um, I don't see any further questions um, audience if you still want to ask some questions uh, we are uh, on the chat and uh, we'll be able to pick up on those questions thank you very much Yugesh um, the, it was interesting to observe the evolving role of the marketing officer versus the customer experience officer. I think it brings out quite clearly the differences between the two roles. Um, I think your examples as well around uh, the different companies and what they're doing and Coca-Cola being a good example of removing the marketing officer role and then bringing it back um, is a testament to the fact that uh, this is not about uh, the existing roles and what they can do, but more about the fact that um, there is a specific function for the experience officer that is not about marketing and is not about service and it's not about um, all the other functions. Those functions have their place and are very important, um, mm -hmm. but uh, there is also a space for the customer experience officer. So thank you very much for those um, remarks. Cool, thanks. Awesome. Um, our next speaker is Sashin and um, you guys will be on the line if we need to ask more questions. Um, uh, Sashin was with us yesterday uh, moderating the panel um, and uh, welcome again Sashin. Um, Sashin, for those who were not here yesterday, is a co-founder of uh, Amio um, and heads the global sales and marketing. Uh, he's a computer scientist by education, uh, you can see from the glasses. Um, and a product person at heart. Uh, Sashin has been involved in understanding needs and delivering customer engagement solutions to consumer-facing companies, and he's been working with CIOs and customer experience leaders in over 60 countries over the last 16 years and believes problems in emerging markets need unique solutions. And we can't agree more, Sashin. Um, we are looking forward to your presentation on the role of uh, customer um, contact centers as CX transforms post-COVID. Um, I think COVID has been a game changer and I'm sure you will have great insights having uh, experience across very many markets uh, to inform it. Welcome, Sashin. Thank you, Mumbi, and uh, I hope I'm audible. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're logging in, uh, folks. I was listening to Yogesh and uh, the business of businesses growth uh, is a quote that stuck in my head. Uh, but when times are, uh, uh, you know, you, what, what does a what does a business leader fear the most? It's usually not uncertainty. You know, it's it's usually not the crisis. I think crisis uh, gives an opportunity to think clearly and you know circumvent the problem. But the uncertainty of how long this is going to run stalls planning. Do you do it temporarily? Do you do it permanently? Are the things that we have been hearing across 2,000 customers that Ameo serves today? Uh, today's presentation, uh, you know, we have been thinking about what what do we take out to the market that is relevant today, and uh, we've decided not to touch technology, right? So I'm not going to bore you with what product, what features has Ameo got out, but I'm going to share some of the learnings that we have had post-COVID uh, learning from our customers. And uh, uh, another uh, small story that I want to share with everyone, I think people have more time at hand. So uh, so if, 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 if you guys are business leaders and you want to talk to your CXOs more, or you want to talk to your customers more, there's generally more availability of people to actually talk to you. Uh, and uh, I've been lucky uh, that we have customers across Asia, Africa, Middle East, and uh, uh, every week, two to three customers, I'm chatting up and asking them, so what are you thinking, right? And those are the insights that we are trying to bring uh, in, in some of these sessions. <clears throat> okay, so um, what has changed today? 
we'll start with that right we all uh, i think yesterday's session if you guys were there uh, we had four uh, customer service contact center and customer experience leaders and we heard from them about what is really changing and uh, uh, i think there were interesting models around pivoting that uh, how do you stay relevant right if you are if you are a offline retail player how do you stay relevant if you are a financial services company how do you stay relevant if you are insurance if you are logistics what has to change so that there is actually demand and your relevance is established you can't wait for things to become normal uh, and uh, though it's a cliche this is normal right this is the new normal uh, there is clear uncertainty on how long this is going to do we're going to touch a little bit about the role of contact center today is it more relevant less relevant uh, and why uh, and then how does uh, how how does uh, a remote contact center actually work? Uh, what have we learned there? Uh, what to look for? Uh, and then, uh, you know, very briefly about what we have got out, but most likely my presentation time would be over by the time we reach the end of the slides. Okay, so I had this chat with the, the panelists yesterday, uh, and I asked everyone, do you think we are talking more to our friends today or less to our friends today? And um, I personally am uh, I'm talking more to my friends, and uh, I've heard most of the people that I ask this, they are talking more to their friends. And why is that happening? Because there is more anxiety today. Right? There's more anxiety about health. There is more anxiety about work. There is uh, uh, more anxiety about business. So people are actually talking more. But if you transpose the same situation in a business to consumer scenario, and we ask the panelists again. Uh, are you getting more calls or less calls in your call center? Right? Even after digitization, even after everything being available on the app or being served by a bot, are you getting more demand for human-to-human -human interaction? And I, I gave a baseline of 20% to everyone. I said, give me a thumbs up uh, if all of you have experienced the same, about 20%. And uh, everybody raised their hand, uh, so it's more than 20%. The other thing that is happening is that there is severe cost pressure on uh, some of the service functions, right? However much we want to talk about customer experience, when the when the CXOs uh, or the XCOs look at the function, uh, they think of it as a cost, and right, so it's a business unit which is uh, which is a cost unit. Uh, now, if there is increase in demand and there is pressure on the cost. What does one do? Right? This is unprecedented. This, there was always a pressure uh, to become a profit center. There is more of that pressure, and there is more demand from the customer for those interactions. Um, but what has changed, which will which will probably make contact centers a little different and uh, uh, more relevant? So think of all the functions, whether it's sales, service, and collections. How does your company acquire new business pre-covid right if you're a bank it was a branch if you are a retail uh, store it's all obviously the walk-ins uh, think about that journey of how they were buying and uh, i was talking to one of our uh, very recent customers uh, they are the largest gold loan provider uh, in the world and uh, they have 5000 branches uh, across india and middle east and people used to walk in with their gold and walk out uh, in 15 minutes with cash. That's their business. But uh, how do you how do you now handle this in uh, uh, COVID era, right? People are not traveling out. People are scared to go into congested spaces, mm -hmm. and people need cash. Right? So how do you uh, how do you handle that? Uh, just see. I was prompted if my Presentation can be made full screen. Let me just see. Okay. Yeah, I'm opening it in the browser, so I guess it's okay. Uh, so when when I talk to when I talk to the uh, uh, business head of Muthur, they launched a new product called uh, uh, Loan at Home. Right, and it was a simple value proposition that whatever you were able to do in the branch, uh, we would 
come to your house, there will be a sanitized, you know, there'll be a sanitization process. Somebody will come to your house and collect the gold, ins inspect the gold and uh, investigate the gold and uh, give you the cash. Uh, the challenge was uh, people would not want uh, you know, somebody who's coming, uh, you know, gold for cash kind of thing and spend a lot of time at home. They don't, it's, it's, it's uncomfortable in their physical space is something that they realized. Uh, so they wanted that it should be a 15 minutes in and out experience, right? So uh, Yogesh was mentioning about the journey. This is the journey. So when uh, a reorchestration of the program was done, they said, we're going to send somebody, uh, he or she is going to be there for 15 minutes and out. Now, prior to that, you need uh, uh, verification to happen, uh, uh, you know, papers to be collected. Uh, India recently allowed video KYC. They wanted all customer authentication to happen prior to somebody reaching the house. And the contact center came into the play there. So they made sure that the appointment, the sales, everything is done and only the collection and investigation and cash, which requires a physical uh, process is done at the customer's house. And they've been able to scale this process pretty well. Uh, and now think in your organizations that uh, some of the functions that were happening, whether it's support, sales, service collections, whatever was being done in the physical space would need solid augmentation. Uh, in India, we work with uh, one of the largest education tech companies called Baiju's. And their sales model was that there was a very important process of uh, the, the sales guy giving presentation uh, at home to the parent of the kid who was using the app. Now, again, that is not feasible. Now, this complete thing has moved into the contact center over a video call or over an audio call. And uh, the contact center is actually closing the sale. So I think it, it requires a little bit of re-engineering of the process, but business is in the business of growth. If, and if growth has to be done, if new customers have to be acquired, I believe the contact centers are going to play a pivotal role, not just during the pandemic, but after the pandemic, because these are behavior changing uh, times, right? Uh, customers will be okay. I think we were discussing yesterday that customers are okay. Seema from CBA was mentioned. Customers are okay with digital mediums. Customers are okay doing uh, remote presentations. So uh, everything that you know of, that required a physical touch, apart from the actual uh, touch and feel part, uh, everything else can be uh, run remotely from a contact center. So uh, contact centers already were playing a pivotal role in supporting these functions, but in the coming future, and in some cases it's already happened, contact centers are gonna play the center stage role. And I call it the last line of human to human connection in a business to consumer scenario. There is no other human to human connection left to be done apart from the contact center. So you will see other mediums, engaging mediums like video coming in. If there's a loan disbursement happening, then a personal interview is gonna happen on video. Uh, the high value interaction, the emotional interactions are gonna happen on video. But the contact center is gonna take the center stage. Stuff that we have been talking about for the last five, six years, not being a cost center and a profit center. So that's one trend that's going to get accelerated. And you as leaders will have to uh, uh, figure out that um, is that is that something uh, that you are observing? Uh, Sarfaraz, we have a short poll for the audience here. If you can just launch that poll before we move further. So a simple question for all of you, will human to human contact centers play a more important role in post pandemic uh, or uh, or no, or, or you're not sure? You're not sure whether bots will replace, uh, whether the physical space will occupy the same interest. Just give us a simple yes, no, can't say answer. And think, think from a perspective of uh, not just the calls coming in, but why those calls were coming in, which business function, which which operational function were uh, were uh, were you catering to, and is that function fully fully functional? Can the contact center <clears throat> augment that? Uh, and uh, I've seen that uh, in most industries, contact centers are going to be the you know, pivotal center stage function to be leading this. So let me just move forward uh, while the poll is happening.
somebody said no okay uh do we have the results of the poll Sachin, yes, we do have the results of the poll. 59% yes, 35% no, 6% okay. can't say. Interesting. So 59%, roughly 60% of the people uh, think or feel that uh, contact centers will play a pivotal role. Uh, and uh, my friend Yogesh mentioned no. So so maybe we should have a chat on that, that, uh, uh, you know, whether it's, whether it's the CX function you're talking about, but I believe that the contact centers uh, are going to play a pivotal role in the post pandemic era and there'll be some automation, but the human to human interaction will actually become more important than ever. The second trend that uh, all of us were forced into was uh, uh, running these contact centers remote. Now contact centers are, if, if you walk into a contact center floor, it's a place with a lot of buzz. Uh, you know, the, the tribe learns from each other, there's tribal knowledge. If I'm a new agent coming in, I'm on a customer call, I face an issue, I talk to the guy sitting next door, hey buddy, you know, what do, what do we do? So there was this very close knit team which suddenly has been distributed. It was also a very tech heavy function and uh, network connectivity, devices, laptops, you know, we were pushed into some very interesting situations. A lot of our customers couldn't even provide laptops to their agents and we had to come out with a mobile app so that they can run actual contact center app on their mobile phone with full enterprise uh, enterprise grade security but that was temporary i think in long run the question that we are asking is okay so contact centers are going to run a pivotal role uh, and they were made to run remote uh, you know people were running around for laptops for infrastructure but are things going to go back to normal uh, when uh, uh, when when the crisis is over and there I, I mentioned this maths. I'll just quickly take everybody through this maths. Let's say if uh, uh, contact center costs are made up of uh, primarily three things. There is the basic infrastructure, you know, the, the seat, the internet, the power, uh, there is manpower, there is technology, and then there is management overheads, right? So manpower, the actual execution, uh, uh, you know, ex execution engine, and that's about 50% of the cost. But uh, what percentage of the cost is the infrastructure? And we actually went ahead and did a research instead of guessing from Philippines till Nigeria, you know, the areas that we cover. And barring Middle East, everywhere else, the ratio was 25%. So if you're spending $400 on, uh, on manpower, you're spending $100 on infrastructure, uh, the basic infrastructure. And uh, contact centers are very, very low gross margin businesses, right? Uh, uh, when BPOs are running, they're running at 15, 20% gross margin max. Uh, and internally also, it's looked at like a business unit with a low gross margin. Uh, now, what if we could take out that uh, the cost of infrastructure? And obviously, there'll be some capex. You need to make sure that the infrastructure at the, uh, at the agent's house is there. If that is a feasibility, if that is a possibility that this can be run, and I'm just asking you to imagine, that if, if this can be run completely remote, that means that you could double the gross margin. Now, if that is a reality and you are not considering it and somebody else is considering it, then this is gonna be uh, you know, quite a lag uh, in terms of you competing in the contact center space, uh, purely on unit economics. And I'm a, I'm a big fan of unit economics. If, uh, if something, if some disruption happens on the unit economics, the business completely changes. So if, if let's say that uh, we are able to run this completely remote, I think there'll be new kind of agents who will be available. There'll be more motivated entrepreneurial agents who will work on uh, their own infrastructure and will work for performance. I think you will have access to agents that uh, you couldn't because pe people couldn't travel to uh, big cities. Uh, and I think the same is true for Kenya and uh, Nigeria or South Africa. Uh, or even India, you know, people live in provinces and villages, and if there is connectivity, why don't they stay close to their family and participate in uh, uh, in the contact center function? It's a it's a function that's easy to learn, uh, but you need motivation to be doing it. So maybe different kind of people will come in. And we went out to our customers and asked that, are you thinking of this as short term or long term? And it was in most geographies, as I said, apart from Middle East, where the unit economics has not changed that much because the cost of infrastructure is very high, 
everybody is planning for this to be long term now uh, they will of course be interesting models not that we, we won't have offices i think office spaces will have a very different meaning there will be places for people to come and connect there will be places for training and learning but the work will happen from anywhere because it can happen from anywhere uh, and there are obvious obvious advantages both in terms of the kind of manpower that you can get and the cost that you you, uh, you know the cost structures that you can uh, uh, you can envisage in the business from both sides we believe that this is a this is a major disruption uh, and uh, as long as the regulatory pitches are okay uh, people are going to go remote 70 80 90 percent of their manpower and then they'll be hybrid and interesting and i'm not talking about two months three months i'm talking about uh, two years from now i'm sure that there'll be more remote agents than uh, agents in office okay. uh, because the unit economics is like that so you better be thinking about that even we started investing in technology and frameworks that would allow uh, you know these kind of systems to be run completely remote let me go to the next slide so we, we talked about the advantages you know there's of course a lower uh, total cost of ownership there's higher workforce satisfaction and productivity all of us have been remote i know that there have been teething issues because infrastructure was not ready but usually we have heard that people feel they are more productive and there's larger talent pool available you could actually set up a team which is completely remote working out of the provinces there's more space there they're closer to their family as long as there's connectivity right and connectivity with the 4g and you know very soon 5g is not a big Fashion, uh, have we lost you or is it just me who can't hear you? I Can you hear me now? Yes, now we can hear you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think I, uh, I've been experiencing issues. I think yesterday also it happened uh, on both my broadband connections. So apologies for that. So the first uh, question we asked, uh, uh, you know, the attendees of uh, this uh, CX summit is, uh, do you think it's a long-term implementation, short-term, till the pandemic ends, or can't say? And there are a lot of people, and there, there are varied results across geographies, as I said, in Middle East, the results are different. In Asia, the results are different. But in Africa, 43% people are already considering, and this is from Nigeria, we have done some polls uh, uh, during our Conversations 20 series, that 43% people already feel this, this is long-term. 22% uh, feel that, no, this is short-term. And 35% are still on the edge. Uh, you know, they could swing both ways. But 43% is a is a pretty large number to think that this is a behavior changing and a business changing moment. Even if the pandemic goes away, there will be long term implementations of remote. And mostly, I hear about uh, hybrid models and not completely remote. There are three factors that uh, we we figured out are going to be critical. And this is again uh, not just our thought or feeling, but our research uh, from from the implementations that we have done and talking to our customers. The first is, and I think I gave this example, in a, in a contact center, let's say if agent says that I'm facing a problem, uh, it's a pretty easy resolution that you get an IT guy to look at it, you know, see whether his device is okay, network is okay, microphone is okay, and uh, most of the time the issue will get resolved. But if somebody is saying the same thing, uh, you know, a few hundred kilometers away, uh, what do you trust do you trust the device do you trust the network and uh, the most important question do you trust the agent right contact centers have been run uh, under close supervision can uh, can that be changed right so that's the first the it and the operation governance of uh, can you trust somebody with data can you uh, if if let's say somebody's using sachin's uh, 
uh, login, can you be sure that it's Sachin? Can we then now augment it with uh, two-factor authentication or a biometric authentication in case of critical business processes? Because security was one of the top concerns that uh, remote contact centers, especially in the financial services space, uh, how do you make sure that the data is controlled? And this will need a change, a little bit of change from a regulator standpoint also, because regulators don't usually allow that to happen. But I think the commerce would drive it and, and that's gonna happen. Uh, it's already happening in some of the geos. Uh, and, and we should watch out because these are game-changing trends huh? that could uh, that that yeah. could set path for yeah. very long term. I'm getting a little bit of eco for somebody to go on mute. Um uh, Mohammed, if you could just check for us. It's done. Okay, thank you, thank you, guys. Not for that. This, this, the second problem is the uh, the actual problem of onboarding and collaboration. Today, you have agents who have been with you for quite some time. They know the processes. What if six months down the line you're recruiting somebody new? How would that function? Uh, because learning, as I said, was very tribal in a contact center. There's training, but then people learn from each other. How would that collaboration happen? Uh, how would and if you if all of you have seen a contact center floor, an agent who has an issue, he raises the hand, the supervisor walks in and helps. There is buddy jacking available. How do you do such things uh, in a remote scenario, right? Uh, so we believe the onboarding and collaboration are going to be the second category of problems that people are going to uh, uh, people will have to solve, right? And and there's no easy solution. There'll be There'll be technology, there'll be practices, there'll be processes, there'll be leadership changes, and there'll be a difference in the kind of employees that would come in future who would not require that much supervision, who would actually be working on a gain share kind of model and will work like entrepreneurs and not supervised uh, uh, freshers, right? So this is going to change quite a lot. Uh, there's also a possibility of varied kind of workforce coming in, and I mentioned about it yesterday. I believe that uh, you would have people with disabilities. Uh, you would have people who are constrained by time, right? So uh, uh, work from home mothers who can spend, let's say, four, four hours, five hours, uh, and, and are skilled, would participate in these kind of processes much more than uh, just a fresher job, right? So I think there'll be a huge transformation on the, on the human side. And one has to watch out for those trends because they are coming, uh, driven by commerce. And the last part is, uh, I mentioned about contact centers playing a more pivotal role in uh, in business operations and not just uh, operational KPIs. So if if I ask any of you that how do you measure the, the, the effectiveness of your contact center, the typical answers are uh, AHT, 80% uh, of the call in less than 20 seconds, right? Those are operational KPIs. But I think contact centers are going to be more and more responsible for driving business KPIs. And the processes will be broken such that you can identify the bottlenecks at each stage. So there'll be more operational uh, excellence uh, that would get implemented on whether the agent is available, not available, flexible timings, um, distributed workforce, delivering sales, delivering service, delivering collections, and not just KPIs for operations. So that's going to be a big change, the third big change that one has to keep in mind because the contact center function will not run the same way. You will not be comping people or uh, incentivizing people on handling times, but you will be incentivizing them on results. And hence results for each of the individual need to be measured better than what they are because today, most of the time, we are just managing operational KPIs. So we did another uh, poll. Uh, and this has also been run across that which do you think is the biggest of three uh, and uh, IT governance and security uh, mostly in Africa that seemed to be the biggest issue in Asia we we, we had a good mix of onboarding uh, and uh, uh, you know IT governance and security business operations uh, everybody feels the need but it doesn't seem to be the most important thing today so I think uh, investing in uh, infrastructure that you can trust and you can identify whether something's wrong with the device, wrong with the network, or wrong with the agent uh, in a short span of time, maybe proactively, is probably uh, uh, you know one of the investments that one can do uh, in, in these times. 
We also did a survey on uh, what channels do you think will be more effective uh, post pandemic? And uh, you know, every time I feel voice will completely go away, voice has an overwhelming majority. In fact, more, there is more voice, uh, there is more call centers uh, who are handling voice calls today, even after bots coming in and uh, there will be bots. There will be bots who will who will solve the problems that uh, a human being need not get involved in. But the human to human touch will will get more importance. Now, email. I think because it's a uh, it's an asynchronous medium. People are looking at that medium. It's a very convenient thing to send an email. But I think, in my view, and that's my personal opinion, chat is going to be the second most important medium. And that too through uh, mediums like WhatsApp or Viber. You know, whatever is the uh, popular uh, messenger service in your country people are going to talk to a bot so so this is how i view view the journey let's say let's look at the collections process you will get a notification uh you will respond that yes i have already paid or how do i pay a bot will try and answer your question and then you say no i want a payment plan and it will get transferred to a human being all this over a whatsapp chat is three separate processes seamless for the customer because he's just talking to the organization on whatsapp but it interacted with the message it interacting with the bot and then with the human being that's how i see uh, uh, channels being uh, visualized in future so uh, yeah i think i'm uh, almost on time here so just wanted to touch that we've, we've, uh, the three problems that we mentioned we've sort of worked very hard on uh, learning those problems and solving those problems uh, and we've been around in uh, Africa for over a decade now, uh, you know, working with some of you and uh, some of your friends or competition, whatever you want to call them. Uh, and these are the two things that we have recently done. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on uh, on actual solution slides, but uh, uh, there is an omni-channel uh, play of contact center. If you see on the left, you have mail, phone, WhatsApp and Facebook all integrated into one medium. So you see customer as one. If Sachin is coming in from any of the mediums and he has had an interaction with us, the agent knows and can respond. And then the same capability is now available on a mobile phone. So you could serve on the fly. And I'm talking about complete contact center capabilities for an agent. Uh, this is available on Android uh, and iOS. Uh, and uh, you could, you could uh, manage and supervise uh, uh, those agents on mobile uh, mobile uh, interface uh, like you would do an agent sitting next door to you. So 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 those were the things that I wanted to cover. I think there's one more poll uh, that we had. Uh, so for us, can we now pull that poll out? And with that, if there are any questions, I can take them now. So this was this was uh, from a management directive standpoint uh, and. Uh, you want to know that what is the directive given to you? What is what is the top priority right now? Modernize, digitize, reduce cost, drive sales, or all of the above. What what has been told to you uh, is your top priority as a CX leader, as a customer service leader, uh, or a contact center leader? Maybe while while this is happening, if there are any questions, I can. Uh, I'm happy to take those questions now. So, um, if I could just, um, I haven't seen any questions from the audience. Um, I'm, I'll wait to see if there are others coming up. But I have a few uh, comments for you. So, um, um, you mentioned. Um, that people have more time on their hands. Has that been your experience? Uh, definitely not mine. Uh, I just find that with remote work, uh, there has been actually increased uh, work. Um, and in, I think there's this thing of either people are feeling guilty uh, that they're not in the office, or there is uh, it's easy to just get on the call and therefore um, the coffee chats uh, have reduced and therefore they've been replaced by actual meetings is what we are finding on our space. Um, from a, from your experience with the businesses and the different markets you're looking at, uh, is the general consensus that people have more time on their hands? So at execution layer, so yeah, I think a, a, a very valid point. 
from an execution standpoint for you know folks who are uh, involved in execution i think there is more uh, what i would say um, stress so because things are happening by the calendar and all of us have uh, adopted the calendar uh, religiously okay let, let's just discuss the so i was expecting that uh, all of the above okay so that's an overwhelming 58% and then modernize digitize 37% reduce cost 5% but all of the above that's that's the actual reality i think it's the toughest function to to drive because people are asking you to modernize increase sales and reduce cost all at the same time and that's that's something that we are observing across thanks thanks sir for us so mummy coming back to your question i think at an execution um, uh level people are more busy because there are more calendar uh invites and people are living by the calendar and there is not there's not enough time so so for example if um, my calendar is out there in the public for my team right so if anybody requires any time they would just uh, they would just block the time and uh, i then honor it uh, but what i meant by people having more time more time is uh earlier if i had to talk to my customer let's say in kenya right mm -hmm. that typically would happen when i am visiting nairobi but given that now people know that that's not going to happen i can request for an appointment that i want 30 minutes with you and they're actually going to find that appointment in the next you know 24 48 depending on the criticality or if i say i just want to have a chat with you i will get an appointment within one week right mm. that's at a, at a at a management executive level people are more curious to learn and they have more time to talk to people so if you have uh, i think we covered that in one of the sessions for all leaders you cannot over communicate in these times people want to talk more and more to their peers their teams and you know spread the message out because you're not out there in the front so even with, with their partners and vendors you know somebody like me approaching let's say a cxo of a bank that you are our customers we just want to have a 20 minute chat with you that what are your priorities this was a tough appointment for me 6 months back but today people are willing to talk on those things because they feel that they need to learn that what's changing right so if you're mm -hmm. able to add value people have more time for you because it's not business as usual otherwise people used to feel busy but there was not a lot to change from a strategy side but an, at at an execution layer i think if i talk to my teams today they're generally more stressed and uh, i'll just give a quick tip something that uh, our our team was able to do we have these meetings called no agenda meetings everybody has to turn on videos and all we do is have fun at that time and we set a time on on our calendars to do that right so if somebody somebody's birthday somebody just got a funny haircut and all of you have seen that right uh, somebody um, uh, you know somebody actually had a tragedy in the family because of covid we just get together as human beings and make sure that we spend some time there is actually time for that which was certainly mm. wishes in office right in office that would happen by chance but today we are saying no we this is important this is critical we need to do this so i think that, that's what i meant by people have more time because you can there is more calendar and more planning uh, than ever before uh, everything was chaotic i could go to my team member and say can you get me get me this in next 10 minutes right today i actually take appointment for everything if i have already allocated something i say can i get this in the next 24 hours can you give me 20 minutes for that and they are able to schedule it so that's what i meant yeah. but a yeah, good question yeah yeah great um and then uh that issue of trust coming up again i think um i guess in an in a cx world uh we can't help but continuously emphasize on trust but i was fascinated by uh you are linking it to governance and regulatory and i think it's quite important an aspect because i think sometimes we think about the empathy side and and maybe because i'm in banking as well uh we divorce uh the regulatory and the governance aspects and their relationship to trust and that they're the ones that build the confidence in um uh in our customers and in our employees so that was quite interesting as well um but bringing in that wrestling with those issues of um governance and regulatory onboarding and collaboration and then business operations monitoring um just uh it was just interesting to see that that uh, trust aspect remains priority for many organizations um does that come out as um relative to the markets so are you seeing differences in different markets uh, uh because one of the things i was wondering is um is governance and regulatory a bigger issue in africa than you find in other markets 
no, no, we actually know most of the emerging geos. And that is why I, you know, you introduced me as that I think emerging geographies require unique solutions. What I see in Kenya is also what I see in Nigeria uh, is very similar to what I see in India. And there are nuances and variations, but, uh, but I think regulators here like to take baby steps. I think India has, uh, India has uh, taken some very, very bold decisions in recent times, uh, whether it's, and I think Kenya was, uh, actually, even before India, the mobile money, for example, Kenya was a great example of, I think some of these changes being driven by the private sector, but the public sector actually facilitating that. Uh, and I'll leave you with one example that happened in India recently, right? Uh, in India, we have a national ID called Aadhaar, right? And uh, that can be used for authentication for everything. Uh, and I'm sure there are, you know, different, different documents and uh, you know, different variations of that that you can use for authentication. Now, one of the processes which is very critical in the consumer services is called KYC. Know your customer, right? And, it, and for a bank, it's very important because there are anti-money laundering laws. You want to make sure that who has the account, this could be a real human being. Uh, and and, and, and in, a, in a country, in a large country like India or even Kenya, right? When government is having direct benefit transfer schemes, they want to make sure that if this is for Sachin, it goes to Sachin, right? Because there are so many middlemen and all of us have seen that. Now, one of the challenges in COVID time was how do you do KYC? Because KYC required you to travel to the branch or somebody coming to your house and taking a biometric that was for large value services. So the, the, the RBI, the Central Bank of India allowed this to be done over a video call. This is unprecedented. I think it doesn't happen in anywhere else in the world because this problem doesn't exist for those guys. But the same can be very easily adopted in, in a market like Kenya, if you have a national ID or Philippines. And these are solutions for today. If I can do the most intimate conversations I have on, on a WhatsApp, why can't I do a video KYC over a, uh, over a platform that is secure, not on public, but secure. So, you know, I think governments are playing a very, very big role in uh, facilitating some of these changes and emerging markets are going to lead this, these changes only because the consumer markets exist here. Everything else is saturated, right? Everybody's interested in these markets and biggest changes are going to happen in these markets. That's great. Uh, fantastic. Thank you very much for your comments, uh, Sashin, and for your for sharing that insightful presentation. Um, I think I was fascinated as well on your last slide that is still on the screen around um, the remote working. I, I personally think that there is quite a big opportunity as far as call centers are concerned with remote working. Um, I have a friend who actually owns a BPO um, call center and uh, of course with the lockdown um, had to send everybody home and one of his issues was that um, I mean even if I wanted them to work from home the areas where these people live uh, will be difficult to equip um, the availability of bandwidth and data uh, to actually run with it so it will be interesting how this yeah. space evolves actually in the future because I think those challenges remain especially for us in in Africa um, and I'm sure in India as well which is very expansive um, yeah. and how yeah. we actually make remote work um, possible for call centers is actually going to be quite critical and I'm sure that Ameo will be at the forefront of these changes so fascinating uh, we have one Thank question. So yeah. Uh, coming from Wavi uh, in Kenya. Uh, I think there was more time at the beginning of the pandemic, but now there's less time on our hands. Now, now as we are just to remote working. Okay, it's a comment, not not a question really. Uh, but did you want to comment around the remote working evolution? So I'm saying, uh, my friends, forget that the pandemic happened or you know, forget that how long it, it's going to stay. I am saying that if the unit economics works and you have been exposed, that is something that you cannot unsee or your competition cannot unsee. It's just a matter of time that the issue. So I think we're losing you, Sachin. Um, I'm hoping that your network will pick up again, but we are losing you, we can't hear you. So um, while we wait for Sachin okay. to get back. Otherwise people were not able to. 
sorry, Sashin, we lost you a little bit, so we didn't hear a lot of what you said. I think we lost you when you oh. were saying it's just a matter of time. <laughs> I'm saying it's just a matter of time that all the problems that you're seeing today will get resolved because the the unit economics is such that this is going to be disrupted. So so it's a question of can you imagine? I think the bottleneck will not be infrastructure. The bottleneck will not be trust. The bottleneck will not be regulatory. The bottleneck is can you imagine this to be running completely remote? If you start yeah. imagining it today, it's going to happen uh, uh, tomorrow. No doubt about it. People have done it. People are going to do this for years to come now. Yeah, and we can link this back to the light solutions we were talking about. Um, I think it was mentioned by Sima yesterday. Uh, the solutions will get lighter and therefore easier even on bandwidth and data and things like that. Um, there's another absolutely, question. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Yeah, IT governance and security is foremost issue. Um, how do your teams take care in so many geographies? So, uh, so first of all, you break it up into what do you want to solve in uh, government security. So the, the most important things were that let's say that this is Sachin who is logging in. We have to make sure that it's actually Sachin who is logging in. So two-factor two authentication, you, you, you make sure that he can log in or he or she can log in only from a certain device. You also make sure that no recording, no screenshots. Uh, can be done on uh, on those devices. So that's from a governance or security point of view. The second is, can you run behind a VPN, right? Can you make sure that the, every data is encrypted when it's passing through so that they cannot be spoofing? So those are the security parts of it. The other and the more critical part was, we started hearing from our customers that our agents are saying they're not able to log in. And this was a very simple statement, which was the most difficult thing to decipher that what do you trust? So what we did was we today uh, at, a, at a central, uh, you know, central place proactively monitor 15 parameters. So what what is the performance of the device? How is the network? Even before the agent says that, the the central command control already knows that these agents are facing problems. This geography is facing problem, and they are able to reshuffle the workforce across queues uh, to do that. Right. So you are proactively monitoring it and establishing governance that any kind of device issue, network issue, uh, application issue is identified before. The agent says that. Now, if you have not identified anything, an agent is still saying, then you know that what to catch, right? So uh, the question is, can you proactively do it? Because there is no time to, uh, you know, handle those complaints. So we have been able to create monitoring parameters across device, application, network, and show it at one central stage that how good is the, uh, you know, how good is the performance if. Uh, if Mumbai is able to handle calls and Sachin is not able to handle calls and both of them are in the same area uh, using the same uh, uh, Airtel network, then if Sachin is saying he's not able to log in and Mumbai is working, there is a problem with Sachin and not with the network and stuff like that. So I'm giving you a glimpse of how this is done. All right. Great. Thank you very much, Sachin. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for such an Thanks engaging so conversation. Yeah. Uh, we'll Asante, now Sana, Mumbai. And yeah, you guys Karim, take care. Karim. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sashin. Uh, next up, we have a panel um, that's going to be moderated by Yugesh. Um, I had introduced Yugesh earlier. If you remember, she was our first speaker of the day. She's the Chief Customer Experience uh, Officer for the CX Group um, in South Africa. Um, I will ask you, Gesh, to then introduce the panelists um, as we start our next session, um, an engaging session of how you reinvent CX post-COVID uh, in the virtual world. Uh, welcome, you, Gesh. So that was uh, remote IT happening uh, telephonically for the online session. Um, sorry about that, everyone. I was uh, muted. Um, um but also the uh, organizer has remote control over um what i can and cannot do so there's a big brother keeping an eye on us to make sure that things happen the way it's supposed to be so i think uh good morning again a good afternoon uh to everyone today's topic of discussion for the panel is around um reinventing customer experience um in a post-covid virtual world um and the points of discussion that we're going to take forward with the panel today uh, is opportunities to create cx during covid ways to adapt to the new normal 
We want to discuss building capabilities for fast changing environments. And we also want to look at keeping a check on real time changing customer experiences. So as an introduction before the panel introduces themselves, I just wanted to you know, set the stage a little bit around um, uh, the new normal. So 150 days ago, we were business as usual. Um, today, we've seen the most radical changes that we're probably experienced, that we've probably experienced in um, our lives. From working from home, uh, children being homeschooled, jobs being lost, uh, businesses closing down. Uh, this has become the new normal. And the new normal is also uh, from traffic to empty streets, uh, from busy weekends spent shopping and at restaurants, socializing, to staying at home and ordering online or waiting in a long line for government food, food parcels to be handed out. Um, so from going out and making sure that you have the perfect shoes, jackets and handbags to ensuring that you have your mask, gloves and sanitizer, the world is changing. Um, a high record of unemployment rates globally. We're learning about online etiquette. Mm. We're having to teach our kids um, grade five algebra. How are we going to cope with personal and business life at the same time? Do we need to wait it out for things to return to normal or is this the new normal? So with that introduction, I'd like the panel to introduce themselves. We have a very wonderful, strong team of people here with strong opinions across Africa that would help will spend this time sharing what they've done and insights of what's happening in their businesses around how to manage the COVID change. Uh, Sheila, can we start with you? Oh, yes. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's, my, it's an absolute honor and pleasure to, to be part of this forum. And I'm um, very glad to be able to share experiences. Just a little bit of a background about myself. Um, I work with I work in the public sector, and um, my forte is in citizen experience. And I serve with the Kenya Revenue Authority, um, so we are not the most popular um, institution in our country. And um, I must say that this pandemic has presented its fair share of challenges, but also learning. Um, in terms of what I handle, I I lead a team of about uh, 400 um, young men and women who serve in the front line um, and this is through face-to-face -face interactions and um, through a contact center that we currently run and um, I think for us uh, the impact has been felt especially in the area of face-to-face -face and taking cognizance of the fact that governments we still operate in um, we still we still believe in actual face-to-face -face contact and physical interaction with consumers so it's a new it's a new forte for us, but also an exciting time to get to see what the new face of CX looks like. So very glad to share my thoughts with the team here today. Thanks, Sheila. Dorothy, do you want to? To go next. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Yugesh. I hope I can be heard. I can see we are having a few challenges with the network, but I hope you'll be able to get me. All right. Yes, my name is Dorothy uh, Jumba. Um, I'm in Kenya, uh, just like Sheila. I work in a private sector. Uh, we, I work with a company called HF Group, uh, which is um, constitutes of a bank. Um, we have a subsidiary that does uh, product development, uh, property development and construction. And then we also have an insurance firm. Um, what I do here, I take care of customer experience. So I lead the customer experience team and uh, that spans across uh, the contact center as well as the, the all the service points within all our branches across the country. 
uh, take care of the frontline staff and uh, just making sure that we're able to give our customers the experiences that we are looking for. Uh, we also look at uh, the experience of our customers at the various uh, touch points, the non-human touch points, um, the mobile and online transactions and stuff like that, just to make sure that we have seamless interactions and, and experiences for our customers. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. Christi Christiana, can you go? I think you're on mute. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Hi. hi. Okay, my name is Christiana Okela from hi. Nigeria. Yeah, hi. Yes. I work with um, IPNX Nigeria. And uh, what we're into is uh, we're an ISP, that's an internet service provider. So you can really imagine um, what is happening to us at this time. Everybody wants to be on the internet. Internet is now the new normal. So we, um, and I'm in the third division, and what we do is to um, give service to all our customers, residential and um, SME customers. Um, so we connect them on, um, on internet. And it's a fiber, you know, fiber connection, fiber to the home. Right. Um, so I handle, I'm the head of the customer experience and advocacy for, you know, the organization. And what I do is majorly to um, work with all the stakeholders. So my job is to ensure that customers have an awesome experience from the point of, you know, sale till when they become our advocates. Um, and part of that is to work on um, strategies to help in, term, to, in terms of um, both the physical and um, digital touch point, ensuring that our customers have a, an awesome experience. Also on support, so we have a contact center, we have self-service options that are available to our customers mm -hmm. to make payments, to support themselves and you know check on normal things that they need in terms of um, ensuring that they have their data up and running. So basically that's um, what I do. Thank you very, very much. It's interesting and I'm sure it's, it's, uh, it's, it's challenging times for you as well. Um, I think we Absolutely. are having a bit of a problem with our ray, uh, our uh, camera, but is Roland and Mark online? It's Roland here. I am Yugesh. Hi, Roland. Nice to meet you. Can you introduce yourself? Um, I like that you say it's nice to meet me. We've known each other for a while, but yes, I will. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, everybody. Hi, yeah. hi. Hi, how are you doing? Good, good, thank you. It's nice to see everybody all gleaming with smiles. You can be uh, hey. lucky that you can't see me. Um, so what am I and what do I do? I work for MultiChoice, Africa and South Africa, which is one of the largest pay TV or is the largest pay TV provider on the continent. Um, I look after customer operations and it's uh, it's a broad portfolio of lots of little things. So I look after analytics and advanced analytics. Uh, technology, which includes exponential technologies, uh, custom experience and journey architecture, um, workforce management and planning. I support all the call centers. Um, but most importantly, I work for about 150 people that work in my department. Um, and I think, you know, we, we often miss that component when we talk about experience as our people. So, yeah, that's me. Sure. Thanks, Roland. Mark, are you there? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I, I am. Um, unfortunately, I have a Mac Hi. camera. It doesn't uh, doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, so I represent SAP's customer experience business um, in South mm -hmm. Africa um, and Africa. I think when we talk about SAP, we think of SAP as a back office ERP provider, uh, but uh, it, it couldn't be further from the case. We, we, we do some phenomenal work with. Uh, customers in South Africa and Africa and globally, specifically around their custom experience initiatives. Uh, so thank you, Yugesh, for the, the opportunity today. Thanks, Mark, for that intro. Um, so uh, just to jump straight into the questions, guys, and my first question for you, uh, and maybe what you could do is, because it's, for, um, it's uh, online, I will, um, if you can raise your hand, if you can raise your hand on the online, uh, on this app, then it'll be great. If not, then just, you know, hopefully we don't talk over each other, but we'll learn as we're going along as well. So maybe even raise your hand and I'll give you, a, I'll call out your name and then you go for it, you know. Uh, or maybe I'll just ask a question to a person as well. So that's going to be what I'm going to try and do to coordinate. 
So my first question to you, uh, to the panel, is what significant insights can you share around the changes in your customers' behaviors, expectations, and sentiments? And as well as what's happening to that satisfaction score in your business at this moment in time? And Mark, can I ask you to start with that? Uh, thank you, Yogesh. So at the end of the day, my, uh, my customers are all of you. So Sheila and Christina and, and, and Dorothy, you're my customers and, and your customers mm -hmm. are, are, are different. But uh, for me, my customers um, are yeah. becoming increasingly dependent and aware of digital channels. Um, you know, so year on year, if we're looking at e-commerce as a channel pre-COVID, uh, year on year growth is upwards of 65%. Um, so my customers are increasingly looking to adopt e-commerce channels specifically from a self-service point of view. Okay? Uh, we're seeing significant traction in uh, call center technology okay? uh, in terms of dealing with customer queries and complaints. Um, so we're, we're seeing big, uh, big trends in, in terms of the adoption of technology to, to improve uh, our customers' interactions with their customers. Can we get some feedback from one of the consumer guys, uh, the guys that deal with consumers directly? Sheila, maybe, can you share with us a little bit? All right, thanks, Yugesh. Um, so for me, well, it's been a bittersweet um, uh, experience and um, I probably shared a bit of our story. So um, being a tax administration, um, our mandate is to collect taxes um, on behalf of the government. And mm -hmm. um, looking at the time the pandemic hit, um, starting the month of March, I think that's mm -hmm. when we went into lockdown. Um, this is the period around which we have our taxpayers file their returns um, for the ending, uh, for the just ended year. So that means we were looking at filing returns for the uh, 2019 um, year. And um, usually this season is marred with um, um, an increase in customer traffic and the increase cuts across all channels. And what we have been doing in the previous years is just ensuring that um, there's early communication that goes out and that way you have more customers come in early as opposed to more customers flocking in towards the deadline, which is um, June. Um, but this year was no different um, for us. and um, you can imagine the customer numbers did not change because the demand or the expectation that the consumer actually files their returns on time um, still remained. Um, mm. So if you look at behavior, let's start with behavior. Um, my consumers did not behave any differently than they do. Um, each one of them, yes, there was improvement in terms of um, early compliance, but if you look at the trend of customer numbers, on the last day, I think on the 30th of June, we served about 20,000 people coming in physically to our touch points mm -hmm. across the country. So that just tells you that um, mm -hmm. in terms of behavior, behavior really had not been impacted. So that means um, for us, the biggest challenge became consumer safety, um, mm -hmm. ensuring the adherence to the guidelines that had been set by our Ministry of Health and um, whatever the protocols we needed to observe. So that became critical. Um, in terms of expectation, I think um, just going back to the consumers around this period, of course, um, there's a lot of uh, this feedback that, will, uh, which is typical uh, of, of, of our, our citizens as requesting for an extension of the deadline. But uh, unfortunately, we were not able to do that um, within the circumstances. It calls for, um, uh, I think, um, it's a process that requires a little bit of investment in terms of time to get the legislative part correct. So on that front, um, that was impossible. So of course, when it comes to sentiment and satisfaction, you can imagine which direction that took. Um, <laughs> the expectation is that um, a tax holiday was to be granted, extension of filing deadlines, but that didn't happen. So. Um, Probably um, the expectation was a different approach from, from the authority. 
So that not coming forth indicates that um, the satisfaction score was impacted. So not necessarily around um, us not being capable of supporting the consumer, but expectation of what they have around um, the revenue administration in totality. So that does impact um, what we call our service de delivery um, holistically. And I think for us then as, as an authority, our area of focus remains ensuring that we, we, we continue upholding our mandate, which is collecting revenue and supporting consumers, but with a touch of empathy um, and, and, and I guess intimacy as we go along this journey. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else want to just add something to or share what's happened in their space from a customer perspective and what's happened to your satisfaction scores and your customer uh, rating scores? Oh, okay. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. Christiana? Okay. Yes. So I'd like to also share a story. You know, like I mentioned, we're an ISP, so we're an internet service provider and uh, we run on fiber, strictly fiber. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine the pressure. So firstly, what happened was um, everybody was yearning for data. Everybody wanted connection. So that was first um, the, um, you know, the uh, ex experience from the part of the customer. So the, the requests were just, you know, rushing in and all of that. But, you know, because of the fiber, you were not everywhere at the same time, unlike radio, you know, so we had to then send out people to do surveys, and that was impacted by because at some point there was a lockdown, total lockdown in you know in Lagos, Nigeria. So it was very difficult. And then we had to, you know, get um, sign up from Liberty for us to move around. So that kind of restricted us. But we did good. Funny enough, we did we were able to you know connect a, a very good number of customers because in terms of customer sentiment and customer behavior, people were working from home. So everyone everybody wanted unlimited data. And you know, there's a fair usage policy that gives a cap of how much data you can use. You know, so as an institution that um, thrives on customer, you know, uh, obsession and customer satisfaction, we removed the FUP totally. And as I speak to you today, oh. you know, we've also saved the um, the fair usage policy. So our customers are running on data limitlessly. I think is highly unlimited. Wow. Right. Yes, we don't have, as I speak to you, we don't have the fair using policy on it. So, I mean, customers are there working from home, streaming, having sessions like we're doing, you know, having webinars and all of that. We have children doing their online classes, you know, so we understand that if we if we dare put that fair using policy, it's going to cause a lot of trouble. So to become a customer dissatisfaction to us, and we didn't want that. So that really helped our CS scores. So customers yeah. are just reaching out, even on social media saying, oh, IPNX, well done, this is great. Thank you for being sensitive. You know, another thing that we did was we did some internal reviews, right? Because we had SMEs on our platform and SMEs, if you're working in an environment where it's, a, it's an office space, like you're on the island or in VI, and there's a total lockdown, you can't be in the office. So we had to mm. then, which you don't do, don't suspend midway. So we had to do a mid-cycle suspension for organizations that wrote to us that, oh, because of the, you know, the regulation in terms of working from home, they would not be able to run on the data. So they don't want to lose their money. They don't want to lose their data rollover. So they sent in an email to request that we suspend. So we had an internal process to, to accommodate accommodate that so we indeed then you know set up that for those customers so, i mean all of them were really happy because we didn't just say okay this is what we, we don't do me cycle suspension and then we'll go ahead to tell you we don't care so to show that yeah. customer intimacy that customer you know that we care about that we show empathy we apply that also in the process so we did a number of them um, process reviews in order to satisfy the customer and that include our mm. cx code and of course we did a lot of things online so before then although we we had planned to run on our uh, online sales portal. Then we realized that that pandemic was going to, you know, be a total lockdown. We launched our online portal, so so customers didn't have to walk in to the i shop to, you know, come subscribe for data. So they were doing it online. Everything was strictly online, and it was awesome. You know, the sales was just tremendous for us. It was a good time, even though we couldn't, you know, honor all the requests because we're not everywhere. But till now, we're doing good, yeah. and and that was what we had to do you know, during yeah. the course and even now. Thank you. So that's, 
That's pretty amazing. And I think that leads to the next question because you guys did some critical uh, investigations at key moments in time uh, during this time and listened to the customer and changed business policies and business uh, processes quite mm. um, well, very quickly in order to satisfy the need. So, um, you know, from a meaningful perspective, the next question is around how are you supporting your customers right now in a more meaningful way? And maybe, um, uh, Roland, can you maybe kick off for us as to what uh, MultiChoice is doing for its customers uh, to try and support them now or, uh, in a more meaningful way? Sure, you guess. Um, so we, we have, so just to explain the MultiChoice business quickly, we have, uh, 20 million Africans as subscribers to our business. We have 80 million African eyes or 160 million eyes on this platform um, on a daily basis. And we all know that, you know, internet and data is not ubiquitous on this continent. And uh, in SA, you know, the access to fiber is for the privileged few. And we as an organization took a stand right at the beginning of this and we said we need to do the right thing not just do things right so you know we've we've extended ourselves beyond just normal programming to give people a semblance of norm normalcy if if you may at the beginning mm -hmm. so we brought uh, things like education to the platform we brought things like uh, prayer to the platform where people couldn't access you know uh, their churches and their temples etc um yes. and you know from a from a sustainability perspective i and i think it's you know we're probably going to touch on this later but i don't think we must think about normal anymore i think uh, the world has fundamentally shifted and if anybody has any inkling of strategy that they've studied before you'll know this is not a reversible reaction um this is going yeah. in one way and we need to plan for scenarios now so you know yeah. our, our plan is to to enrich Africa and to make sure that we are doing the right thing. We abandoned yeah. our customer experience scores in, in month one to make sure that our people were safe first. Um, mm -hmm. And then it took off from there. Most of you will probably not know this, but we moved over 2000 agents to work from home within two weeks. Um, That's and Absolutely. And you know, the, 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 the commitment yeah. we get from our people post that is, unheard of and the ripple effect is obviously an improvement in customer experience of course of course so i mean that that for me is uh, is exceptionally insightful because you didn't go out there to look at okay so how can we make extra money during this time it's about how do i provide and bring some normality back to this consumer that's going through a myriad of changes right now mm -hmm. and i can tell you that you guys have become um you know the 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 the, the teacher when i'm not around to try and um help this five-year-old uh educate himself so he's gone into self self-educating but he's he's got the tv on so that for me has helped and i know from a personal perspective with um you know uh, family and parents they've also um uh, resorted to uh, the tv to help them understand what's happening outside there and also to stay closer to their religion and what used to be the norm. So that's that's fantastic. Dorothy, from your side, from a contact center perspective, what have you guys um, uh, done from a, a, a massive change or introduction of new things uh, to make sure that you become more meaningful uh, to your customer? Dorothy, can you hear me? Uh, yes, thank you, Yugesh. Actually, we've done a lot. Uh, we've done quite a bit. Yes, I can hear you. Um, yes, I can hear you. I think there's a bit of a lag. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, being in banking, our consumers, our customers were heavily impacted with all this. Some people lost jobs. Some people have had uh, reduced uh, salaries and, and, and income. And to be able to push on them on that, there are various initiatives we had to take into account. Otherwise, a lot of those loans would actually be going bad. 
So part of it came as an, initi an initiative from the regulator, which is the Central Bank of Kenya, which guided on, um, on things like loan restructures. So that one was a big one for the banks. So we had to look at our, all our loan portfolios and just try to see how then do we restructure the loans for the customers so that we can be able to give them some, t some holidays of sorts, some loan holidays, mm -hmm. so that some months they're not, they don't pay, but we push the repayments to later on in the year. So that's one of the things that we have done. We waived the charges that normally come with loan restructures so that customers would be cushioned around that. The other thing we did was to remove some of the fees on uh, on some of our transactions. So the normal transactions that attract uh, certain fees, especially the mobile uh, mobile based transactions. So we waived the fees on a lot of those, so that again those customers are able to uh, have their transactions, move their trans their money around, and it's not so straining onto them. So over and above that, we also saw a lot of our traffic move to the digital, to mobile banking, to online banking, and, and we had to then beef up and really stabilize those platforms to make sure that yeah. our customers are actually able to transact more in those uh, particular platforms and, uh, and, they're not, and they're, they don't really feel the change much. Um, mm -hmm. Another aspect we saw um, a big change in, a lot of our customers stopped walking into the branches for obvious reasons. People don't want to walk mm -hmm. around uh, much anymore. And mm -hmm. that presented for us a bit of a challenge. Banking being as heavily regulated as we are, we rely mm -hmm. a lot on face-to-face -face, uh, verification of the customer. So we mm -hmm. had to introduce other, other ways of verifying that I'm actually dealing with an authentic customer. So in came technologies like uh, what we call EKYC, e electronic KYC, where I'm able to tell who my customer is and they don't have to walk into the branch. So for account opening, we had to put it on, on, um, on platforms where the customer can open an account end to end and they never have to walk into the branch for that. How to make platforms that they were previously using for transactions like online banking, just making them more secure so that the customers now can transact from the comfort of their homes and they don't have to walk into any branch. And then also just to keep the conversation alive with customers, as, as, as they normally say, people transact or people do business with people they like. We've also just mm -hmm. tried to engage our customers more, talk to them, so that it's not always a sales call, it's more of a care call. Because now mm -hmm. that I care for that customer and whatever is happening to them now. So we are doing a lot of uh, web seminars, uh, webinars on various topics, on personal finance, on SME management, how to manage a small business, really segment targeted so that again, we keep the conversation going and we are able to help our customers through this uh, rough patch uh, in, in, their, in their business. That's absolutely fantastic as well, because uh, you, you can see that uh, you probably introduced so much of change in this short space of time that you were probably debating over in boardrooms months on months on end. And now yes. there's no debate anymore. There's a demand because of the pandemic. So the pandemic has in itself introduced a lot of technology and a lot of uh, innovation and evolution at a very, very fast pace. So that in itself has brought this Absolutely. new employee experience to, to the fore. And my next question is around the current employee experience. And, you know, so, so, so what's changed about the employee experience? What are the challenges from an employee experience? And how are you measuring it right now? And maybe Mark, I know that you're going to leave a little bit early uh, for the panel, so maybe you should go, you can go first, is I'll be very interested to understand how you are implementing your solutions from a B2B perspective remotely, or how are you selling right now? You know, how does the sales guy get his job done? Because we still need to meet numbers. I don't know whether Mark's left already or is he still there? It looks like he's Maybe left. Maybe Mark's. Yeah, I think he has. So, um, 
let, let me let me repose the question then, guys, from an employee experience perspective. Even the new the roles, the way we used to work, the salespeople used to have to sell. We had face to face selling. We had uh, meeting and having uh, coffees together to sell products to clients. Um, you also have the uh, you know the the employee that's now working from home. And like we mentioned earlier, there's I'm sure each one of you guys have understood that there's just no time in the day. You start in the morning with online meetings and you end with online meetings and you're working longer hours and every there's there's no time to action on to complete actions on meetings sure. and you 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 have back to back sessions no no time to even eat um, how has that employee experience changed how are you trying to support it and how are you measuring it at the moment um, I can open the floor anybody that wants to speak. Sure, you guess I'll go. Um, so, I was I was mentioning to Mohammed uh, earlier that number one, we've planned for this kind of scenario for the past three years. We do uh, business continuity planning, and there's several scenarios that we do boardroom simulations, and we've had simulations of this kind with, with smaller teams, of course. Uh, yes. What what would happen if you had to if there was a nuclear explosion, for example? So the transition, as as much as it was logistically difficult, it was planned for on our side. Um, what I can tell you is that from a work from home perspective, um, you have to trust your employees. There is no, there is nothing like trusting a person to do what they need to do, number one. And you need to show them that trust because I can guarantee yeah. you the person that you cannot trust is the one that you can't, you don't show trust to. So we have to treat our mm -hmm. people like adults sometimes. And um, yeah. the other is I have, in my team specifically, requested that every one of them take three hours out of their day to perform family duties and anything that they need to do. So that is booked in their diaries ahead of time. And I have also instructed my execs not to try and book my team within those times. So I think yeah. we cannot encroach on people's lives just because they work from home. And it mm -hmm. is critical that we show them that respect as well. It, you know, working yeah. long hours and often into meal breaks and things like that is, is for me, a sign of bad leadership. So, yeah. you know, we, we don't own people. We work for our people. That's that's a very uh, refreshing view, uh, Roland. And I think um, most of us need to also do a check on how we're leading at this moment in time when the people on this panel are responsible uh, to lead uh, big teams. Um, is there anybody else that wants to share what they've put in place and what they would suggest that needs to happen from an employee experience perspective? And, you know, mm. let me know how you measure it. How are you currently testing to see that you're doing a good job? Um, you guess, I think I'll give it a go. Um, just picking up from where Roland left it off, um, I think um, I'd also say that we had uh, our business continuity plan in, in place. But um, the reality is I don't think it played out um, in the manner that uh, we had planned it all these years. Because like I started working on oh. this about four years ago. So one thing that had to happen very quickly is that, uh, you know, when, when, when the pandemic uh, hit, you move into, you're in denial initially, think this thing will go away. Um, then you move into the space of, um, okay, this is still here. Okay, then panic. Then suddenly at panic, we realize <laughs> that, okay, work's got to continue. And yeah. uh, we've still continue, we've got to continue supporting, um, but I have people here and I'm compromising their health and safety. So one of the big things mm -hmm. we had uh, started implementing yeah. around technology was ensuring that um, uh, we, we'd always talked about having a virtual contact center. Uh, sorry, an alternate mm. contact. The only thing is that I I never envisioned it being a virtual one. Um, and in this case, we were thinking probably three years back that it would be a physical facility mm. at a different location. Uh, but now it happens that people are working from their homes. So the alternate is being in your house, okay? And uh, like Roland, I think it's just being sensitive around, um, yes, you're at home, work has got to continue, 
my expectation on productivity did not change. In fact, around my season again, and as I'd mentioned, we're looking yeah. at the peak period of, 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 of um, supporting consumers. We needed people to put in their best foot forward. So that meant productivity was to an all time high. But one of the biggest considerations for staff in terms of ensuring that they were comfortable, um, you could work at whatever point in time you wanted to because traffic was consistent, especially for those who are working from home. The ones who had to remain in the office physically, this we broke down into shifts of less than 30%. And um, with additional guidelines just to ensure that um, customers are managed without exposing staff. So where a customer feels they need to bring a physical document, we then put out notices saying, please scan your documents and send them to us. We're still working on document okay. management, not quite there yet, but scan and send them so that you don't have to come here physically and compromise yeah. stuff. And what we realized is in doing that, productivity went up. People wow. had, were able to work more, produce more, mm -hmm. there was more output. And this was not imposed, rather by introducing mechanisms that indicated or that communicated to the employee that I care about you then the rest becomes their responsibility to deliver. Um, for those who are working from home, like I said, you would choose, I mean, yes, we take, uh, we respect um, um, traffic in terms of calls and emails and all that, but in terms of the spread of work, that those who opted to work late into the night because of stability of the system at that point in time, and that we allowed. So when you looked at productivity, overall productivity, this did go up, at least for me. Um, it wasn't a struggle then. And I think um, by and large, the employees felt supported um, in empowering them and enabling them to do their work. So the trust still remains. I've got to trust that you're doing. But for me, I, would, I was able to verify because again, your reporting comes to systems, customer numbers are mm. visible. In supported, um, emails closed, calls closed, and so forth. You're able to yeah. see that. So that creates that there was tangible output. That's, that's, that's awesome. Um, you know, we, we, we spoke about uh, how we change radically. And I mean, it's 150 days or so. We went through lockdown. We're now in partial lockdown. Uh, we still have this virus that we need to uh, you know, everybody's worried about, con you know, uh, um, contracting the, the virus. We needed to keep our employees safe. Um, and we needed to also keep our families safe. Um, with all of this going around us and all the change that needs to be uh, contained and managed, we also need to move forward with business, right? So each one of you guys had plans in place before uh, lockdown started, you had a, um, a, a customer experience strategy that you were implementing. How are you making sure, or are you making sure that you're moving forward with these plans? And what's the reception from the rest of the people and the teams on how you move forward with it? Or does it take a back step? And if this is going to be the new normal, how are you going to make this work? How are you going to make sure that your top five objectives to achieve at the end of this year, one, is still relevant, and two, you move forward with it? Uh, Dorothy, Christina, you want to share, maybe? OK, so I'll, I'll go first. I hope you can all hear me. Uh, OK. All right. So. Um, you know, I was smiling because yes, part I of can. our CX strategy is to move a lot of the physical things that we do in the eye shop, that's what we call it, to the digital space. So for us, it's like we're just um, walking along the path that we've actually um, set up for ourselves for the beginning of the year. So for example, um, while the lockdown was going to happen, yes, we also have a DCP and all of that. And as a January, when we saw that the thing was getting stronger, we started making plans. And on the 24th, because in Nigeria, it was on the 24th of March for Lagos, 
that um, you know, federal government said, Lagos State said everybody should be on total long total lockdown. So it meant customers couldn't visit the eye shop and all of that. So it just quickly helped us to close out on all of the plans that we had, like the online sales portal that I mentioned, customers being able to pay online without having to visit the eye shop to use the POS or come and pay cash. Right. So everything yeah. we've been doing actually was in line with our strategy. So we are moving on. We're doing well. The numbers are growing, you know, tremendously. And the initiatives are being breathed as, you know, we are concluding some of the projects. So our, our online portal now, you can do a lot of things. We're even going to onboard where you can even pay online via the online portal. That's against, okay, we send you an account number. So the number of things that are changing. So it's very much in line with the, um, with the vision of the, of the um, organization. So we're doing well. Although somebody said COVID-19 is like the new CEO. I mean, there's certain things you don't even need to get away from justifications and all of that for. Once you said this is what you want to do, just okay, go ahead and do it. Because I mean, the review it is in line with what the customer wants. And of course, safety. Because one thing is for sure, apart from you being able to work, you want to even be alive. So mm -hmm. that is critical to every single one of us, all of us seated in here. Do you understand? So it's very much in line with our strategy and, and we're doing pretty good in that um, space. Okay. So thank you. Okay. Oh, Dorothy, from a, um, a internal um, employee okay. experience, how yes. are you moving forward with your strategy and how are you getting people upskilled, trained? Mm -hmm. um, how, are you, how are you maintaining that? Okay, I think for us, uh, why we are a, we may be a little bit lucky. We had a strategy that we started implementing last year. We had a two-year strategy that we started implementing um, company-wide last year. So quite a bit of it had uh, already been rolled out, and most of it was how to move onto our digital platforms more, move most of our customers onto digital, and and now engage them, and now be able to to get feedback and 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 and, and cross sell and upsell and all that. So. The first bit of our strategy, we had already started on it. So we were we already moved into the digital platform and certain engagements had already started. However, they are still part of the strategies that we had to just put on the back back burner until later, where we wanted yeah. to do more of customer engagements, physical engagements. We started a bit of those last year, but now because yeah. of all this, of course, we can't. Um, however, we've tried to shift it a bit and see whether we are able to engage as many as we are able to through our web meetings. Our web meetings were targeted, targeted to our various uh, customer segments, and we've seen that working pretty, pretty good for us. Um, mm -hmm. One of the other areas we've we've uh, had to change is to do budget reallocations. So areas where we needed money to drive certain parts of our strategy, and uh, we were mm -hmm. not getting money then. Actually, this has come almost as a blessing in this guys. We are able to now <laughs> ask for budget reallocation. I mean, if you have sales staff who used to go to the field to sell, they can't go out now. So yeah. can we get a bit of that budget? Can we get the uh, transport <laughs> budget? Can we get all those other kinds of budgets? And I'll be able to run some of the CX projects that we actually wanted to run. Um, and then uh, one of the things we've, we've also taken advantage of to run our strategy and drive as much as possible was around our customer contact strategy, where now we are using NPS our net promoter yeah. score very, very heavily to just get to know how do these customers feel about our brand. And, and given this time when we are now um, all available to work and not many people are moving out, how then do we tweak our processes? How do we tweak uh, some of the products the customers are not happy with? How do we change some of those processes that have always been a bottleneck so that now we are mm. able to actually now, um, by the time we emerge out of this, if we are going to be a point at which there's emergence, we will be at a much better place. And even going forward, we're able to build um, and, and change those experiences. And I think going forward, even a lot of the business models will change because some of them are heavily premised on, on outdoor and stuff like that. So we are also seeing ourselves changing a lot of those uh, models to, uh, to be accommodated within this new normal. Okay. Yes. So, guys, the big question about what's happening right now in the market is the unemployment rate. And the unemployment rate right now is increasing significantly, and it's almost a double-edged sword for companies. One, you're losing a huge amount of employees yes. because 
of business changes and uh, different demands from the consumer. Um, and then the second thing is you've got consumers that are unemployed, that are unable to pay for your services or unable to, um, uh, you know, pay installments. Mm -hmm. um, so how how did your business, if they have gone through any, you know, if they've had to let go of staff, how are they managing that on one hand? And how is that impacting the culture of the business? And on the other hand, how are you handling the customer that's just lost his job, but has been a loyal customer for the last 10 years? How are you handling that? Roland, do you want to take that? Sure, you guys. Um, so as a business, we've made a principal call not to go down the road of retrenchments, even though profits are being pinched. Um, okay. And that is, um, you know, I mentioned it earlier, it's, it's, it's trying to live up to a, a broader and bigger purpose rather than a business strategy. So, you know, I find that as a guiding light that works wonderfully well. And especially in times like this, when, you know, you're looking at what is an essential service, if, if a business has a broader purpose, especially to its community and its, its you know, its continent, it will survive. And in terms of our customers, yes, our customers have had severe financial pressure. We've, um, you know, we've, we've taken to write off quite a bit of debt. Uh, you know, we, we're not a, we're not a credit provider, so it's not technically debt. Um, mm. And also, you know, assist some of our customers with, with long-term payment plans if they are struggling. So we've really kind of tried to get behind our people during the next uh, last four months and the next six, more than likely. Yeah. Um, sure. And you guess we've also been, you know, core to supporting youth employment, um, specifically in the media industry in, in South Africa and in the rest of Africa as well. So. We've, we've donated quite a bit of money towards upliftment of those communities specifically. That's fantastic. It's now that brands are starting to stand out and depending on what the brand does, it almost gives you direction as a leader in the business as what you should be doing and what you can do. Any of the other guys want to comment on, uh, you know, how you managing the unemployment uh, space? Okay, I can go on for that. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, fantastic. So it played out differently for us, um, you know, in our own um, area. So what happened was uh, I looked at um, the roles. So for example, we had the iShop executives. They were, I mean, they wouldn't be at work because there's total lockdown. So we reassigned roles, right? Um, so we added more people to be able to attend to customers in terms of customer support, because all our contact center agents were working from home. So we increased that number because we realized that customers needs were increasing. They wanted to get more information and all of that. And then we also increased the number of our retention team. So the retention team were the ones um, calling up these customers just to check on them, to know if they're okay. Particularly those that we observed that were not, you know, resubscribing. Right, mm -hmm. and then we're able to direct feedback. So you hear things like, okay, we're locked down because our office is at so and so location, we can't go there. However, I have another account of yours in my house that I'm using. So we then collated data, particularly for those that were locked down because of COVID. And for those that said, okay, I won't be available at this time. So we use that data to then manage those customers one-on-one. -on -one. So we brought in what you call customer intimacy and then showing that empathy. But we didn't have any staff go off because you know of the changes. In fact, it was more or less like a blessing in disguise for us. So those agents are those agents now are now more skilled because separate from you being able to attend to customers one-on-one -on -one in the shop, you now have the training on how to support customers on the phone and for some how to engage customers from the retention point of view. You know, so it was more of a plus for us. Thank you. That's awesome. So guys, we're at the end of the, the panel session. I'll just open up just for a quick mm. um, two minute wrap up. Um, do you, what advice would you give the chief, the experience officers, success managers, um, heads of customer experience, heads of customer operations, what advice would you give to them um, in 20 seconds, if we can go around the table, virtual table. 
<laughs> yeah, Sheila, can we start with you? All right, Yukesh. Um, I think there's been a lot of focus um, on what the external customer wants, and I take that as a, as a practitioner myself and a professional. But I think the new focus should be on employee experience and focus specifically on the ease of doing work. Because all these great technologies, yes, have to be rolled out by somebody. Do we have the right skill? Um, do we have, um, I mean, skills, especially in areas such as user experience, ensuring that the end product then becomes something that's amazing for, for, for the external customer? Um, how do we need to pair teams internally to support these consumers. So the new area of focus would be an employee experience and new service indicators that you know promote um, this uh, way of work in this new dispensation. My take. Thanks. Thanks, Sheila. Do Dorothy? Yes, um, I think for me it's to to really encourage people to embrace embrace the the changes that have come, and I think a lot of new business opportunities have come out of all this and new ways of doing things, um, so that we are able to take advantage. And and for me, I'd really want to drive self service for the customer because we are beginning to realize we also may never be able to employ enough people. However, if we are able to empower our customer as much as possible, then that way the customer is able to actually get the solutions that they want to the questions they have. And this in the back end may even mean engaging with business partners who are able to give us end-to-end -end solutions. For, so for instance, I'd want to see the day my customer can, from the comfort of their house, actually be able to use my product to even pay their taxes, pay Sheila, to be able to pay their electricity, their water, everything from the mm -hmm. comfort of their home, but facilitated by me. Yes, so that self-service and end-to-end -end solution provision for me, I think is a great opportunity that can come out of this crisis if our businesses actually leverage on that. Perfect. Thank you. Christina, 20 seconds. All right. Oh, <laughs> thank you, you guys. I think for me, I would like to take it on both sides, both the customer experience and the employee experience. What I would recommend to all the CXOs out there and people in leadership is listen, listen, and listen again. Listen to what your customers are saying, use data, analyze that, and you know, review your business processes in line with what customers really want, not what works for you. Because to show that you're very, uh, you're customer obsessed, right and then you show that intimacy you need to listen and you only yeah. listen by paying attention to the data for your staff let's look you also need to look at not just about the customer if your staff is happy then your customers will be happy trust me that you can't you can't have a, you know uh, uh, an angry staff and then you want a, a happy customer it doesn't work so you need to make sure that your staff are also happy your employees are happy and how do you do that empower them help them support them we had a number of webinars that we did during the course of this pandemic ranging from how to work from home how to manage yourself and your children how to man how to even mentally be stable we had those kind of series for employees so these are things that you can do to help so from both sides we need to have a balance between the customer and the employees thank you thanks christina roland oh 20 seconds okay um probably three things <laughs> uh, as a leader you need to care and implicitly and explicitly care for your people and your customers uh, you need to abandon what we see as process and industrial age construct. And trust me, I know about this thing. I've been in, in mining and in manufacturing and it just doesn't work. Um, <laughs> and focus on your purpose, the, wh why are you here and engage your people. And I think it was Cristiano who said it earlier, absolute listen with absolute empathy. Yeah, yeah. Gosh, guys, I think we could talk about this um, for the entire day because everybody on this panel is so passionate and you've gone through major major changes and you've managed to survive and things are working out for us so um i think we've ended we've reached the end of the panel discussion um i think we've discussed as much as we could in the time that we have uh, Mumbi, I'm going to ha hand over to you do we have any questions from the audience um at this point in time um no, we don't. Um, I don't okay. see any. 
I just want to say thank you very much to the panelists, uh, including uh, Roland and Mac, uh, who've chosen to stay away from the camera. Sorry, Roland and Mark, I'm sure that's not intentional, but <laughs> just had to say it because they're just ladies on the screen right now, which is beautiful. Um, so thank you all of you for your uh, wonderful comments uh, to our audience. I will just take a minute to wrap up um, uh, out of our two sessions yesterday and today. Uh, but to the panelists, thank you for taking the time. Uh, thank you for putting in uh, a lot of thought uh, into what you've brought on board. I'm sure it's absolutely useful uh, to those who've been listening. And thank you, Yugesh, for moderating uh, such an insightful session. Great. Sure. So, um, I'm going to take a minute to actually wrap up before I hand over to Mohammed, who will close the session for us. Um, and if I was to give an, a word for yesterday's session, I would have given trust. Um, as it comes through intimacy and empathy. And if I'm to give a word for this session, I'll probably give it change. Um, and the fact that uh, we started off with Yugesh talking to us about the evolution of the CMO versus the CXO role, and just how uh, there's continuous change and those two have not settled even now. Um, we see people moving from one aspect of um, the focus to another aspect of focus uh, because uh, the two roles continue to evolve. And I don't think it's just those two. Um, Yugesh did talk about other areas uh, that cover CXO uh, function and those continue to evolve and we will continue to see change. Uh, my view on that, uh, don't obsess about where this function sits, rather obsess about the customer and then it doesn't really matter where you sit. Uh, then we spoke about change as far as COVID has presented it to us and um, the effect it has had in terms of remote working and digitization and uh, the ability to uh, bring to the fore again uh, technology. Uh, we were starting to push back uh, with the concept of uh, technology being the end all for everybody and we know it's still not the end all but it has come back to the fore as a huge enabler to us to uh, adapt to the change that COVID has presented and I think that's going to continue. Um, then there was discussions around change in the customer behavior, expectations and sentiments that uh, came through the panelists um, and real life situations of how the panelists have uh, tackled these things um, in the last couple of months as they navigated through COVID. Um, so I would give today's session one word and call it change. Uh, transition has been fast, as uh, accelerated by the COVID situation, but the thing is uh, transition will continue. Uh, we will continue to see more change uh, in our lives and I think uh, we can remain with yesterday's message around empathy and intimacy and our ability to connect truly with our customers and employees. I love the fact that employees kept coming um, almost at the same speed as customers and um, that is very critical in driving change in the customer experience world. Um, and also just to remember the key pointers around agility, engagement and empowerment. So thank you very much. Thank you for listening to me. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity, Mohammed, to uh, chair the conference. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I'm just going to hand over to you now to close out the session. Thank you. Thank you, Mumbai. It was absolute pleasure to have you as the conference chairperson. You were absolutely wonderful. Thank you for your insights. Thank, thank you for being the pillar of the uh, for the last two days. So really appreciate. Uh, I take this opportunity to thank each and every uh, attendee delegates and everyone who have been a part of the uh, CX Transformation Virtual Summit for the last two days. It's been a pleasure to host you know, all, all these wonderful people. We've got so much of insights that they have been sharing, uh, so much of knowledge, and I'm sure each and every attendee who have been part of this uh, virtual uh, event for the last two days will definitely, definitely walk away with some great insights. I also take this opportunity to thank the sponsors, Genesis, SAP, and Amigo for uh, uh, you know, making this uh, a grand access. And last but not least, all the speakers, you know, without uh, excluding anyone or without naming anyone, but every other speaker who have been part of the event have brought an absolutely uh, amazing insight. So uh, thank you everyone, one and all. And I'm sure we did go through a few tech glitches here and there, but then we, we were still able to pull out a very successful event. Thank you everyone and uh, see you amigos. Until next time, have a lovely evening ahead. Stay safe, stay healthy. Bye-bye.